It's a multi-billion dollar industry that can be devastating to relationships. Drake Bell speaks out about the sexual abuse he suffered at the age of 15. Then it's a time to spread a message of love, acceptance. Accused of sexually assaulting young girls in his care over a period of 19 years. I was proud to have ended the ban on transgender men. This is the largest pride event North Idaho has ever seen. It's amazing how confidently we use language. Take the word love, for example. Love is a concept that almost everyone can get behind. Some use it to talk about sexuality, others use it as a synonym for tolerance. For many, it's a general positive feeling of affection and care, but we must define it. We invite you on this journey with us as we discover what love is, not according to the world, but how God defines love. Amen. Hey, we're doing something a little bit different tonight. Is that okay? Awesome. I, I don't really know why we ask questions like that as preachers, because we kind of have already made our decision. We're not voting. And it's like, it's not really a vote, but we love your buy-in. Yeah. It's always nice to be in unity. Hey, uh, tonight we are going to be doing a QA. and a and um, we actually have a number up on the screen that you can start texting in questions. Logan is going to be our moderator. He's going to be looking through the questions. And uh, we're going to do our best to offer godly, theologically sound, and edifying answers to those questions. And I wanted to open us up with a scripture um, that, that kind of talks to uh, the generations and um, how the faith is passed down. Uh, the first time where I heard this passage preached that I can remember was when Pastor Leo shared it at man camp several years ago. He's, he's since gone on to be with the Lord, but I was so gripped by the way he taught this passage. So I'm just going to be reading a little bit from Psalm chapter 78, the first several verses. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. Amen. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Here at Heart of the City, our desire is that we would present a gospel and live a life of discipleship in such a way that it would be passed from generation to generation to generation to children yet even unborn. We're not about one lifetime and a flash in the pan, but we truly have a vision for generation after generation after generation of discipleship of mothers and fathers raising up sons and daughters in the faith. We have a, what we call a pipeline philosophy here. And we want to see people in that pipeline from the early age, from the, you could say the pipeline begins in the womb all the way to the tomb. And we believe that people should be in that pipeline all their life. To buy into the lie that your kid turns 13 and they're going to be a hellion, 18, they're sowing their oats. You don't have to buy into that lie. Jesus has something better for them, something very powerful for them. And we believe that with all of our heart. Um, I'm really excited tonight because I'm, Radine and I both are super proud of Seth. And uh, we are. And, uh, and our daughter, Jamie. Uh, and our four grandsons, and Topher in the back, and on and on and on. We love our family, and I'm not going to try to hide that. 
uh, we are freaks for our families. We have family night every Monday night and date night every Friday night, and we pour into our family and always have. Our kids have never known a family without having a family night. And so it was really unique that Don shared the word legacy when he prayed over us at Heart Prep. He didn't know that when I was walking out of my house tonight that I just looked up the definition of legacy. And so it's an okay definition. It says the long-lasting impact of particular events, actions that took place in the past or of a person's life. Legacy to me, you'll see generations in the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God speaks in generations. You know, I think of like Jesse and David and Solomon and on and on and on. And so uh, it's our heart, Radine and I's, to leave a legacy in our kids and then our grandkids. Like most of you know, if you've been around, I'm reading a Bible for each one of my grandsons and I write in it every day. Right now I'm reading two Bibles because they're twins. And I read, I carry them with me everywhere. They've been to Singapore or Mexico, you name it. Because I write in them and I, I read them every day. Why? Because we want to leave a legacy. And so tonight I'm super excited that we're just going to share. Uh, we don't know what Logan's going to ask us. Because we don't know what you're going to ask us. But we're just going to do our best. Holy Spirit, speak through us. We're going to be very real. I've always been very real with my family. And we're going to be very real, share from our heart and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. So the first question we have for you, were the shoes planned? <laughs> we actually both walked in uh, today with different shoes on than these, um, but we actually keep these shoes in our office. We share an office and we keep them up there so they stay nice. We actually only wear them in here. Um, <laughs> And so someone gave us the idea, you guys are sharing together. You guys should wear your J's together. Yeah. And so we did. Can I, can I expand on that? Of course. Let me expand on that a little bit because they're not just any color. <laughs> Next you'll, question. You'll notice that they're not, they're not teal and purple or any of those Vikings or Seahawks or none of that any of that. They're called, they're called Steelers. Here we go. Steelers. Here we go. Uh, next question. Russell's taking us to the Super Bowl. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Start off a little light, but let's dive in. The, the first kind of, I tried to organize these. So if your question doesn't get answered, know that it, it might've been answered by another person's question that got brought in. But the first stuff we kind of want to talk about is parenting. Um, so I have some questions for you in that. The first one is this parenting is tough and exhausting at times. There are days when we feel heartbroken and scared. What do we do during these difficult times as parents? You want to go? All right. Um, pray in tongues. I'm, only, I'm not really even kidding about that. Um, you know, there's this, there's this principle that we don't know how to pray as we ought but that the Holy Spirit intercedes through us. And sometimes when I'm with my son, I have no idea what to do next. Yeah. Trying to find the line between being overly disciplinarian or being a pushover or protecting them or letting them actually experience some pain and suffering so that they are adapted to the world. And it's just this spectrum that is so hard to know exactly where the heart of God is, sometimes exactly on the spectrum. And so um, we pray a lot in the Owens house, and we often pray, God, would you help us parent Jameson? And um, we pray with him, and we pray over him, we prophesy over him, and um, we, and my, my wife and I, Micaiah and I, are really a team in that. And we give grace to each other, and we give grace to him, and then we go back to the Lord, and we do it all again. Yeah. Beautiful response. Um, just so you know, if you're, if you're texting in right now, it is asking for your name. You don't have to give me your name. You can remain anonymous. Um, the next one, I think this one's more pointed for you, J.O. Okay. It's regarding sibling arguments. Obviously, Seth, you can time it if you'd like to. 
What kind of recommendations do you have to help bring peace in the home? Sibling arguments. Let me say this. I thought that was an amazing answer that he gave. Absolutely. Because some of you may not be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you're like, what is he talking about? You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every one of you, 100%. Because in Acts 2, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And then you can pray in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to lead you. He wants to counsel you. So that was a brilliant answer. There's a lot of other things that you can do, but that's a brilliant answer. So kids, fightings, uh, whatever it may be. I mean, I can remember Seth and Jamie in the back seat. And uh, it was like this. Seth was over here playing with his little men or whatever and did not want to play with Jamie. And Jamie wanted to be all about interacting with Seth, and Seth was not about that. And uh, Jamie would be like, uh, we'd be like, don't touch Seth, stay away from Seth. And she'd be like this. <laughs> and so there's nothing easy about those things. I remember Jamie used to like give him baseball cards out by his door so he would play with him, her. And so, yeah, everyone feels sorry for Jamie right now because <laughs> I don't want to make Seth feel really bad. But it was just very real stuff. And so we dealt with that uh, as parents. So we would talk about it. We would talk about it. We would, um, you know, pray about it. And I don't want to give you just generic answers because we would discipline them about that. Did you guys discipline? Yes. If you don't like that we were spanking parents, well, I'm going to get it out there right now. We spanked our children. Not abuse, but it spanked our kids. Well, jail, how can you do it? It's just crazy. It's like, do you read your Bibles? It's not like J.O. invented it. God, the, the creator of heavens and earth invented it. And so, not abuse, but spank. So we did do that, but Radine would be very much more patient with them. I would be more of the disciplinaire, but we both disciplined them. But we would discuss this. And uh, sometimes it'd be timeout. Sometimes it would be uh, spanking. Sometimes it would be, maybe we'd even bargain with our kids. You know, I'm not saying that you should always do that. But just working with them, and you don't never give up on your kids. Yeah. They grow through different seasons. And so some of you right now, because you're so stinking infiltrated with this world that it shocks you to think somebody would spank. And it's, it's just so ungodly, the infiltration of this world and the lies of this world because we want to raise up godly men and women. And it's not all about just spanking, but it is discipline. And it's not like, hey, discipline them and just let them go. And no, you walk through those things. You talk through those things, line upon line. Take them to the word of God. Um, and, and prayerfully walking through those things really, really helped us. And, and it wasn't always perfect. Sometimes... You know, they, they just was going to bicker and, you know, the next 200 miles or what have you. And so, but they grew out of it, just understanding that a lot of it's seasons and they do grow out of it. But you got to, you got to stay on top. You just can't let them do whatever they want to do. You want them like I would view Jamie and Seth the best friends now. And so, but it wasn't like that when they were 13 and, you know, like 15 you, you hear what I'm saying? So let me sum it up. You, you pray with them. You discipline them. You stay on top of it. You don't give up. You share with them and uh, walk with them through those difficult times. And just remember that it's a season. I hope that helps. I just want to share one thing from the same story from my perspective, and that is this. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I don't, I'm not going to defend it. No, actually, I would speak worse of my side. I have nothing to defend. I was a total knucklehead. Jamie was great. I was a jerk. Jerk 
I almost just said a worse word than jerk, but the Lord <laughs> helped me control my tongue in that moment. Um, this is what I want to say. My parents never gave in to the current reality, Seth and Jamie don't get along. They never gave in to it. They prayed and they prophesied over us until they saw it come to pass. And I was 19 years old and I was walking around on my college campus and God broke my heart for my sister. I'll never forget it. I remember it was in the fall. It was in the fall of 2011 and all of a sudden I just, it was like I got hit by a train and the Lord dealt with me and showed me how much I had missed it. But I remember my mom, she would leave little notes in my underwear drawer and she would prophesy over me and talk about who I was, even though I wasn't that person then. She would wow. prophesy over me, and my parents would pray for me, and they would never give in. Well, maybe Seth and Jamie just aren't going get to get along. They continued to pray and prophesy over us, and after I moved out of the house, they continued to believe that there would be a change that took place, and God broke my heart. And it was never the same again. Do not give up on the relationship between your sons and your daughters, between any of your children. Because it can change in an instant. Wow. We might just stay in parenting. <laughs> um, let's do one more for parenting. Uh, can you speak about engaging in spiritual warfare on behalf of your children? What does that look like over your kids? You kind of just touched on it about what your mom did for you, but is there any other nuggets that either of would you give about spiritual warfare Absolutely. and how you go to battle? Absolutely. My daughter struggled with fear, and we would talk to her about that, that fear is a spirit that's not from God, and we would pray over those things. And all of a sudden, you go into her bedroom, and she has all these scriptures written on her mirror that she did it, or in her bathroom, all over the mirrors that she did, and she would declare that word over her of breaking off fear just just declaring it and prophesying that she wasn't going to be ruled by fear. And man, it took place. She was completely set free. That's, that's Jamie. There was a time where Seth uh, had seen something and he had struggled a little bit with, it was, it was kind of a unique thing. It was with tinies and bigs, bigs and littles, and it started confusing him. And so we had two ladies come over to the house because he was having some of those night terrors. And I was like, hey, I'm just not going to get used to night terrors. That just doesn't feel right to me. Night terrors and him struggling a little bit in his heart and in his mind with bigs and littles. And don't, don't ask me to, to explain that. I don't fully understand it, but it was in his little heart right? And so there was something that he has saw on, you know, dinosaurs or whatever. And these two ladies came over who operated, where's Doug at, in deliverance. And they prayed over him very specifically, very, very with great authority. And listen to me, my son was set free now. He was, no, listen, now. He was set. So those are two areas of full deliverances that we saw with other people's influence, with them standing on the word of God, taking on, you know, that sword of the spirit. What do you think the sword of the spirit is? Well, who do you think the word is? Absolutely. Jesus. And just working that and them learning to do that. Wonderful. We're getting a lot of parent questions. So I'm going to do one more parent question. I'm going to tie these two together. Um, what was one thing that you thought you were going to do as a parent before you were a parent, but you ultimately changed your view on? And I'm going to tie that one together with what was the biggest thing that you prepared for to be a father? What was the biggest thing you did to prepare to be a father? What did I do uh, to prepare to be a father? I mean, there's, there's things that, like, you don't fully are prepared for until you are, yeah. you know, you don't get a book on, you know, like a, you remember VCRs, you'd get a whole book and still it would just, you know, the light would go off and on the clock would just, cause you never read the book and you don't get a, you don't get a specific book on marriage though. You have the Bible. You don't get a specific book on, on being a father, but you have the word of God and so Radine and I, 
Everything that we were challenged with, we would pray, we would fast, we would seek God. And this is not, I'm not trying to be super spiritual here. If you want to know what our house was like, I mean, that's, that's how our house was. I would seek counsel with other dads. What did I do mostly prepared to, to be a father, to be honest with you, like I do a lot in my life, is I would seek first the kingdom of God. And that's not just trying to be, oh, that's a cool little scripture. No, I would stink and seek first the kingdom of God. Did that with my wife, did that with being a father, uh, did that all throughout my entire life is seeking first the kingdom of God. And God would lead us in all the different things that we were faced with as parents and getting prepared. Um, one of the greatest things that me and Seth did that prepared us in our journey, and I, I won't go into it, but it was rites of passage. Rites of passage whenever he turned 13. I took him on a high mountain deer hunt, and he, he knew the day. He, knew, he knows the day that he became a man. So that's something that you can do to help prepare your son to be a man is you tell him, not a prostitute, not some crazy girl, not somebody from a sorority, not somebody from the bar, not, not even a, a girl from church. He knew when he was a man the day that mom and dad told him he was a man. So and good. so that time he wrote a letter to Micaiah whenever he was 13, did not, of course he didn't know Micaiah, but he wrote a letter to his wife and then we married them and I got to see her read that letter that he wrote when he was 13. So these are some of the things that will help prepare your son to be a man. And I tell you what, to be a parent, you better be all in with Jesus. Because Holy Spirit, he's the counselor, he's the comforter, and he will do these things if you lean into him in the area of parenting. And of course, we took parenting classes and stuff. That really was a blessing too. You know, back in the day, what was that class, sweetheart? Growing kids God's way. Now, that was old school. That was old school, but it was still very powerful, so. Beautiful. We're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to kind of just call this subject just just sin, pretty much. Anything that kind sin? of... Sin? Sin, yeah. Things that fall under that. Um, first one would be, how do you approach someone living a sinful lifestyle instead of just tolerating it? I don't... Hey, I can answer it. We're sharing. Personally, that... Uh, that is kind of like a, a, a fork in the road for me because it, it, it depends a lot on if that person is in Christ. Yeah, that's good. If that person is in Christ, I feel very comfortable being very bold to go to my brother or sister in Christ and call them into righteousness, call them to repentance, call them to uh, bring even rebuke, rebuke and reproof. Um, and say, hey, look, brother or sister, this is not right, and you need to, you need to go the other direction. I think that um, with someone who is not in Christ, someone who's not put their faith in Christ, it doesn't mean that we can't call them to repentance. I mean, we know that Jesus came out right the gate and said, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Um, but I, I do think the approach looks a lot different. I think from my perspective, when someone is not in Christ, my first goal is, is not to instruct them about their sin. My first goal is to give them a revelation of who God is. Beautiful. Because when they encounter Jesus, all of a sudden, they have a new heart. Yeah. And when they have a new heart, they have a heart that can receive rebu rebuke and reproof and instruction. I actually believe that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So for me, talk, I know this might sound bigoted, but I just have to, I, I have to, I have to go with scripture before I go with any cultural opinion. And the, and the word of God says is that fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and it's the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. And so when I approach someone who does not fear the Lord, my standards for them understanding their sin is very, very, very low. And my standards for turning from their sin is very, very, very low. I believe that a revelation of Christ is the beginning of repentance. So beautiful. 
Beautiful. And we had a lot of questions in kind of the area, probably because of what we've been talking about in this series so far. Um, a lot of questions in that area of how, how do we love people that are a part of the LGBT community? Um, how do we love people that are in a sinful lifestyle? So I, I love that response that you gave us. The next question I present to you is, what would you say is the greatest difference between how humanity tends to love and how God tends to love? What is the oh, greatest difference? To me, that's very simple. Humanity loves like this, with a hook. I was raised with loving with a hook. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. If you don't do something, man, you're shunned and not spoken to or what have you. But God doesn't, he doesn't love with a hook. He loves unconditionally. So he's, he, he doesn't love me because I'm lovable. He doesn't love me because I'm lovable. He loves me because he's love. If you think that all these other things is love, I got news for you. There's only one that's love, and it's God, the Father. And so I have made mistakes in life, uh, just like everybody in this room, and I'm still loved of the Father. And sometimes it's easy to get busy in life. And I go through my devotions and things like that, but not really connecting with him like I want to. But he still loves me. Yeah. And so that would be the main thing is that the world, my goodness, loves with a hook. And if you're like that, fight against that. If you're like that as a parent, fight against that. Don't, don't, don't manipulate and let me say something about, because it scares me when I talk about spanking, because if I ever hear of anybody in our church abusing kids, then I'm going to talk to you about that sin. I'll talk to you straight on face to face, because this is what spanking looked like in our house, is that we had a little kitchen wood spoon. We did. And um, I would have to go get it. So if I was kind of like a little because I'm pretty intense, I would have to go get the spoon, and they either got one or three licks. And it was according to, you know, it, 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 they didn't get spankings because of mistakes. They got spankings because of open rebellion. Just a, even just a little rebellion. You, you dishonoring your mama, you're going to get a freaking spanking. Are you, are you feeling me? And dads, you need to hear me because you need to, you need to lead. The biggest problems I think with kids today is dads don't lead. Yeah. You need to get your head off the sand and lead your family. Do you know one of the least times that people come to church is Father's Day? And I just go, what, what in the heck is wrong with dads? I want to say other things, but I won't. Well, since you kind of brought us back into the vein, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this one in because I think it's really important. And just knowing you and your character, both of you, I think that you'll have a good response for this. Um, how do you put God first and even then family over your provider role, even if your job is ministry to God? Do you mind repeating that? Yep. How do you put God first and then family over being the provider? And then specifically, even if your job is ministry to God, which would be what, what we live. Uh, you would be a lot more of an expert on this with how many years you've been doing it. Um, but I've been, I've been on staff here for 10 years, this month actually. Um, this, this is what I would say. I would say that if you specifically in ministry, I think one of the great temptations is to count service to God as connection with God. And I think it's one of the most enticing deceptions. Um, now, service to God is a good thing. <laughs> you should serve God. <laughs> um, but I think that one thing that I've tried to do to help keep myself accountable is sermon prep. And me and God time are different things. Now, 
Am I with God during a sermon prep? Darn tootin'. Um, but I know that I'm, I can tell I'm getting unhealthy when I'm starting to justify my work that I'm trying to do for God, for the people, and calling that our time together. Because the way that I think about it is like a human relationship, like with my wife. There's time for us to accomplish things together, and that's good. But that doesn't count as the time for us to know each other more and truly connect. And this is what I I would say is, it would be weird if you only went on group dates with your wife. It's weird if you only go on group dates with God. And so for me, the number one accountability for me is, Seth, are you only seeking God to prepare you for the next ministry opportunity? And if you are, that's not relationship. That's slavery. And there's a difference. He no longer calls us servants. He calls us friends. And of course, I want to be a a doulos of the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. But it has to come beneath. I'm a son. Son always has to come before servant or we'll be jacked up every time. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. How do you love on your family members who are part of the LGBTQ plus community and still let them know that you don't support their lifestyle, but you still love them and want the best for them? Another question kind of in that same range was, I'm going to a wedding and they have these beliefs and I want them so desperately to know that I love them, but I don't affirm. Can you clarify the second question? Are you saying they are going to a gay wedding? Is that what it is? They're going to a wedding with family members. Uh, Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, they're going to a wedding with family members that are either non-believers, believers, believers, or homosexual lifestyle. I don't think they're going to a homosexual wedding. You want me to hit on a couple things? Yeah. I'll hit on a couple things. First of all, if it's a homosexual marriage, I'm not going to go to it because that's impossible for two of the same sex to get married. That's what the world says. Now, I know that some of you might get mad at that, but I really don't care because, I mean, I don't. Because if you get mad at that, you're so worldly and secular that you need to, you, you need to wake up out of all due respect because I love, 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 uh, I got family members that homosexual, whatever, totally love them. But if they get married, I'm not going to their wedding because that's impossible. They can't get married. Okay, first of all, that. The other thing is how I will say this, that in my life, it's not been easy. It's definitely not been easy because we're pastors. Most people know where we stand. If they don't, they get to know quickly. So for us to love them, we love them right? But we've been called on the carpet of, hey, if you really love us, then you're going to accept us and say that homosexuality is okay. And then it's like, no, we're not because it's not okay. Okay. So let me make it clear. If you're a homosexual, you're not a Christian. Okay. J-O, that's pretty, f- no, no, that's not a J-O theme. That's a Bible theme. That's what God says. It's not what J.O. says. Are you hearing me? Okay, so I can still love the person. I mean, I, do you know how many people that I've loved that struggled in meth or alcoholism or, you know, we had a heroin addict live with us? Loved. So it's kind of strange that Some people don't think that you can love them because they're homosexual or a homosexual may think that. That's not true. But I'm not going to condone. I don't tolerate their sin and what they're living in. So first of all, relationship with them, okay? I had a relationship with a homosexual in Boise, this type of relationship. I was their pastor and I was discipling them, right? And so it was all built on relationship. He got the snot beat out of him because 
He was trying to get out of that world and out of that scene, and he came to me, and he was beat up really bad. He shook hands with me, and there was blood in my hand. I mean, he was really, really jacked up. But I was, it was all about my relationship with him, meeting with him every week. Are you hearing that? So I would say through relationship, but even through relationship, sometimes it doesn't work because they, they, if, if, if a person says, listen, if you really love me, you're going to say that homosexuality is okay and it's biblical. And it's, no, I'm not going to do that because it's not biblical and it's not godly. And so uh, I'm going to do my best to continue to love. But still, that is not an easy subject. But we're going to. But I would say through relationship, and don't you change your biblical stance because of what the world is doing. If I have a, if I have a, a, a kid or a grandkid, I'm not going to change if, if they if they somehow say they're homosexual. I'm not going to change my theology. I want to do everything to love them through it, but I'm not going to change my theology in the Father. Are you feeling me? So some of this may be shocking to some of you guys, but I'm only sharing what's scripturally, you know, what's Bible. Um, on that same vein with LGBTQ and the way it is in the world today, this question is talking more about schools. Uh, speaking on that scene, what they are pushing in schools, how do we decide on schooling? And if you were to do it all over again in the culture of today, how would you go about making those decisions for schooling? I will touch on that because he hasn't made that decision. Now, I'm going to tell you just... Me and Ray Dean never were what we would considered like homeschool parents. But now we would really have to look at that because I'm not going to send my child. Our whole philosophy on school was Seth and Jamie, you're going to go into the public school and you're going to make a difference. And if you start losing the battle, we're going to talk about it. That was our whole philosophy with our kids. And they wasn't perfect with it, but they did. They hung in there pretty good, right? But today, because of what they're teaching and the indoctrination of it, um, I think that we would probably homeschool. I'm just being honest. Or send them to an amazing, God-fearing Christian, God-fearing, not a Christian school that's kind of pansy. <laughs> My wife and I are still working through this. Uh, we have a two-and-a-half-year-old. So um, I would say this, and we do talk about it. We're not being passive about it. Um, one thing that I've seen that I would just say is, I don't think it's one size fits all. I think that there are some people who like to make really strong blatant statements in this area with schooling. And I actually believe that different children and the way that they're designed by God need different kinds of care and different kinds of, uh, of education situations. So, so for me, I look at, I've seen some really good fruit from homeschool and some really gnarly fruit from homeschool. I've seen some really good fruit from public school and some awful fruit from public school. And I think part of it has to do with the design of the child. Part of it has to do with the way that the parent shepherds throughout the process. There is a, I think there's a way to shepherd your child through schooling uh, because my parents shepherded us through schooling. We both went to public school. And granted, I, I, get, I get that things are different. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that they're not. Um, but I would just, I would just caution friends, if you can just hear me, and if you could receive from me, is that you may actually go different routes with different ones of your children. And that would be okay based on their design and their call and the way that God has, has formed them. And they may actually succeed in different forms of schooling. Um, and so I would just, I would caution the blanket. Wonderful. So we have time for just we have time for just one more question, and we'll, we'll kind of switch gears with this one, but I thought it was a wonderful question, and it might be because of my gift bent, but I'm going to go for it. 
What is your attitude towards the current church body's boldness to evangelize? Are you worried we're not doing enough and being selfish with what we have here at the heart? What needs to change if anything does need to change? Well, it, it never feels like when it comes to reaching the loss that we're, we're fully winning. Because I'm not convinced that all of us is sharing the gospel. The first thing that Jesus says is, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But it's, it's, it's so strange. You see people that's followed Christ for a long time and it's like they forget that. It's like, I'll be a teacher of men. I'll be an apostle of men. I'll, I'll be a, a prophet of men. I'll, well, he says, follow me out and be a fisher of men. First thing that you do is you fish for men. And so I think if we were, me too, all in in reaching people with the gospel, just, just look in this room right now. And then there's going to be two more gatherings tomorrow and two in Post Falls, just with Heart of the City, the impact that we can make on our community if we're willing. And I get it, everyone has different gift bits. That's what Logan was talking about. But even at the heart, we share the gospel at every gathering. And even if you bring someone, I mean, that's not really biblical, for you to bring someone from to hear the gospel, but hey, we'll we'll take it. I mean, if you just if you're so you know quiet that you're just never going to share the gospel, I think that that needs to change. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. You need to, yeah, you need to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. You do because that really impacted my life. I mean. After I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I'm on the streets preaching. My first date with my wife was street preaching. It just is a whole different story. So um, what can we do different? I think that you're going to hear things like we have a class called Lostology. It would be so cool if Lostology wasn't like 10 people. But it was more like 100 people. But I guarantee you, if I brought three prophets in here to prophesy a word to you, there'd be 3,000 people. I, I, no, I'm just being honest. I'm being very honest because most Christians want more. Give me a word. Give me a, instead of sharing the word of God that can change lives. You know, evangelism is not easy because... Everyone, it is very risky because everyone's not going to receive from you. Everyone's not going to say yes to Jesus, but that's okay. Do you know how many people is, oh gosh, I don't even know how many people have told me no. But there's also a wall out there with names all over it for the people who have said yes. And that's just over a short season. So, when you hear lostology, sign up for it. If you don't know how to share the gospel, learn. If you don't know how to share your testimony, we have a small group to teach you that. Why? So that we can really impact our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let me read the scripture. It says this. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I've commanded him in Horeb of all of Israel with the statues and judgments. Behold, I send you Elijah, the prophet. This is the last scripture in the Old Testament. The last scripture in the Old Testament. Behold, I send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, this is actually the last scripture. It says, and he will turn, what's the Lord going to do in that day? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. 
lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. That's the passion that God has for us to be in a relationship with our kids. I talked to a gentleman this week that hasn't talked to, you know, one of his kids for many, many, many years. And then he told me of another guy that hadn't talked to his kid for 10 years. God wants to us to have relationship as fathers with our kids. And you do whatever you can to restore that. I don't care. I don't care. Beg whatever it takes. Restore that. With that, God, the ultimate Father, Heavenly Father, wants a relationship with you.